So the first item on my list was, um, oh wait, you should probably begin by telling us who you are and uh, naming for viewers the, the title of your book. So good morning, Rodney. Yes, my name's John Broom. Um, I'm a historian and author. My latest publication is the latest in the Association of Cricket Statisticians and Historians Lives in Cricket series, and it is called Ray Smith, Man of Essex. That begs the question, who was Ray Smith? Well, Ray Smith was a, an all-rounder who played for the Essex County Club from 1934 uh, through to 1956, a period that obviously um, encompassed the Second World War. Um, he was a, a journeyman, a county cricketer. He was a very good standard. You know, he, he got his contract year after year, never quite made international as in terms of the England team. But my particular interest in Ray Smith was twofold. Firstly, I've researched cricket during the Second World War, and Ray Smith was one of the major characters in the English game during that period. And secondly, my own father, um, who was born in 1916, grew up watching the Essex team of the 30s, 40s and 50s. And I know Ray Smith brought him great pleasure, so I thought it nice to... Um, acknowledge and commemorate Ray Smith's career in book form. And as you say, it hasn't been done before. So let's give viewers and listeners a good picture of what kind of cricketer he is. Uh, beginning with his bowling. Uh, what kind of bowler was he? I understand he, he varied um, his, his approach a great deal. Yeah, I, th I think he varied throughout his career. I mean, he, he started off as a young man bowling sort of fast medium, mainly in swingers with the odd ball that swung out. Uh, but he was required at times to bowl off spin, certainly after the war. As Essex's bowling de um, stores are very depleted, um, loss of Ken Farns to sadly um, death, serving with the RAF, the loss of Stan Nichols basically through retirement, um, cricketing old age. So um, Ray's bowling style varied from innings to innings and, and match to match. He's basically a, a fast medium in swing bowler who could also turn his hand to bowling off spin when required. Now, he's remarkable, perhaps most of all, for the sheer volume of overs he, he got through. He, uh, has a number of records to his name on that front, doesn't he? He holds the record for the most expensive uh, 100 wickets in a season. Um, I think an average of about 37 because there is, is, he was required to bowl so much uh, that particular season. He holds records for the, uh, I think, the most runs conceded in a match for Essex, 291 against Middlesex in 1947. Uh, third most expensive innings analysis for Essex, 202. So it might sound like Ray Smith spent his county career getting carted all around the, the playing fields of England. But uh, I think we had a case where, as I said, after the war, Essex's bowling resources were severely depleted. The captain in those first um, post-war seasons, a man called Tom Pierce, his career um, overlapped that of Peter Smith, Ray's cousin, uh, and and Ray himself, and I think Tom Pierce relied a lot on his old comrades, his old colleagues from the 1930s to basically see Essex through that difficult period. I think there's a, a lovely quote from Doug Insull, who who took over as captain from Pierce in 1951, who wrote, "Tom Pierce was happiest when the Smiths were bowling, which means that on average his joy was dimmed for only about six overs a day. His great tactical ploy was to switch them round." and make Bray bowl with his cap on. So yeah, Ray and his cousin Peter got through huge workloads in bowling that you know would be anathema to the, the modern cricketer um, who seems to tire after four. Smith the batsman, he was an all-rounder, as you say, and a very capable batsman, certainly by the end of his career. Uh, his, his record is, is notable for a, a, a steady, even remarkable improvement over the course of many years. Yeah, in his first few seasons, he, he contributed very little with the bat. Um, I think he made his highest pre-war score, I think it was 91 against Yorkshire at Bramall Lane in 1939. Um, obviously, the war then curtailed any sort of batting development during those years, but he holds a unique record in the first-class game. He's the only batsman I batted to have scored the fastest first-class century in an English season on three different occasions, outperforming such luminaries as Garfield Sobers, who did it twice, Ian Botham, who did it twice. Um, so Majid Khan as well did it twice, but Ray Smith's the only man to do that three times. He's quite a mercurial batsman. He was a, a hard-hitting striker of the ball, and when it came off, it came off really well. And when it didn't come off, there'd be a succession of, of low scores against his name. I've got a note here to the effect, it's an impression I got reading your book, that the improvement in his batting might have been 
might have been somewhat brought about by the alleviation in his bowling duties. The fewer overs he had to bowl, perhaps the more time and energy he had to focus yeah, on his the, batting. Yeah, the physical energy, yeah, because after the war he was into his sort of mid to late 30s. To um, so say Essex was struggling for the first couple of seasons, but then Trevor Bailey emerged uh, and a fast opening bowler called Ken Preston, which meant Ray had proportionately less work to do. I think when Doug Insall took over as captain, after a rocky couple of first seasons, he sort of got a grip of his his team and, and uh, marshalled the bowling resources as he wished to, rather than as Tom Pierce would have wished to. So, yeah, Ray then had the sort of mental and physical energy to concentrate more on his batting and um, produce some fine innings in the in the last few years of his career. As well as that, I think we ought to mention he was a electric fielder as well in an era where fielding for many people was almost seen as an afterthought. You know, what what you did between your bowling stints and and your batting innings, uh, Ray was a very keen fielder. So I think in the modern game, with his you know clean striking of the ball, his versatile swing and spin bowling, and his keen and electric fielding, I think he would have you know done quite well in in the one day game. Now he made rather a slow start to his test uh, to his first class career. Mm-hmm. Perhaps you'd talk us through those those early years. So he made his debut in 1934, and the seasons 34, five, six, and seven what Ray had to contend with was the availability of, well, three fast bowlers for parts of the season. So we had Ken Farns, who was obviously a bowl of international standard. Farns was a history master at Worksop College, a private school. So he would be unavailable um, up to, say, the end of June, beginning of July, and then would walk into the Essex team. Um, They also had a, a man called Jack Stevenson, Lieutenant Colonel J.W.A. Stevenson, as he appears on many scorecards. Similarly, he would be intermittently available between army duties. And then there was uh, a man who was considered at one time the fastest bowler in England, H.D. Hopper Reed, who, again, uh, whose star shone brightly in the Essex team. So when any of these three amateurs, or on occasions all three of them, decided they were going to play, Ray had to make way and go back and play for the Essex club and ground side or, or club cricket for Chelmsford. So I think he, he found it very hard to establish a consistent place in the team. You also had uh, Laurie Eastman, a long established professional who had been playing since the, after the, the great war. Uh, you had Stan Nichols, who was a superb all rounder again, represented England on several occasions. So he was very much at sixth or seventh place in the, in the pecking order when it came to, Fast medium bowling. World War Two came at rather an inconvenient time for him. Yeah. He was just hitting a stride. I think you you say that it was the Colchester Cricket Week of 1938 that was mm. really personally transformative for him. Uh, perhaps yeah, you, he... you you talk about his war and and the pity of its coming when it did. Of course, it was a pity for far greater reasons. Yeah, yeah and, and usually amongst um, cricketers of that generation, uh, Ray played no part in any of the the armed services. I know all his pre-war comrades at Essex, his cousin Peter uh, went on to be a captain in the Essex Regiment. Tom Pierce got a commission. Famously, Ken Farns joined the RAF. Um, his uh, comrade Sonny Avery served over in the Far East. But Ray, um, because of flat feet, wasn't allowed in the army, um, wasn't, couldn't swim, so the Royal Navy was out. And the Air Force didn't want him. And one of his sons said he remembers a letter at home um, you know, it was in the family archive from um, Plum Warner, Pelham Warner, commiserating with Ray that he wasn't able to do his bit in in that regard. I mean, he did join the Civil Defence Service and did fire watching on the steeple of uh, his own church and down at, on the roof of Colchester Cathedral. Um, and he was served as a special constable in the Essex and Stabley. So he did his bit as far as he could in terms of um, of service, but his main service in the war seems to have been on the cricket field. Perhaps you'd say a bit about his wartime cricket, actually. Let's elaborate on that point. Ray was a professional player. Um, you know, he, he, he'd earned his county contract in 1938, got his cap, as he said, at the Colchester Cricket Week of 1938. Um, and the first couple of seasons of the war, he, he appeared intermittently for a team called the British Empire Eleven. Now, the British Empire Eleven was the brainchild of a, a young 19-year-old um, RAF officer called Desmond Donnelly. And he thought to entertain the, the the crowds, the wartime crowds, a team made up of players from different parts, as it's a, as the name suggests, of the Empire, playing against invitational 11s, against army signs, navy signs, etc., would be a fantastic idea. And, and so it proved. Uh, now, after a couple of seasons, because of um, 
the ebb and flow of the war, players were sort of shipped out to the Middle East, players were shipped out to the Far East, etc. So Ray, given his position, was one of the few players who was almost permanently available for the British Empire eleven. So he was invited, I think from 1942 onwards, to captain the side. So this is at a time, and one of the interesting things I came across when I was researching the book was the Essex Minutes, the Essex County Cricket Club Minute Book. Back in 1935, the professional players, including Ray, had had a, a reminder that if any amateurs who they were familiar with from other counties came to play, they still need to be addressed as Mr., not by their first name or, or by some sort of nickname. So there he is being told, on the one hand, everybody's Mr., and then a few years later, there he is captaining, um, including one match, he captained Ken Farns. So, you know, you wonder if he had to refer to Ken Farns as Mr. Farns. I severely doubt it. So yeah, he, he, was, he was the right man in the right position at the right time. So he, he played cricket in a way that was um, attacking. It was the spirit of the game that counted. Yes, he played hard. Yes, he tried to win. But if he didn't, you know, all that mattered was the crowd got their entertainment. The team, you know, some of the best players on, you know, available at the time playing. So, and he was lauded by luminaries such as Plum Warner, Sir Stanley Rouse, who was chairman of the British Red Cross uh, fundraising for the contribution he made to cricket and to British wartime culture. You touched briefly on his tensions with the amateurs, which is an interesting subject and recurs mm. repeatedly in your book. One gets the impression that it was rather more fraught at Essex than it was elsewhere. Perhaps you'd say a bit about that. I think we had the context of once the war ended, his cousin Peter, as I say, gone and got a, a commission, uh, being Captain Peter Smith of the Essex Regiment, um, and it wasn't unique to Essex. Obviously, we had other professional players gaining commissions in the armed services, Les Ames, Headley Verity, etc. So they come back after the war and they resume their professional contracts. Right? And once again, it's a case of, well, famously after the war, wasn't it, um, Fred Titmus when it was announced over the Lord's Tannoy. There's a, there's, a, there's a mistake in the scorecard. FJ Titmus should read Titmus brackets, FJ close brackets. So still very much in that culture. So Tom Pierce had been captain of Essex on a part-time and full-time basis since the mid-30s. His career was coming to an end, 1950. So they were looking for a successor. Now, at the time, the professional cricketer was not expected to be a full-time captain of a county. It was still before the years where Len Hutton assumed the England captaincy. So Essex went in search of the next available suitable amateur. I think it had one time been envisaged that Trevor Bailey would take that role. But reading between the lines in the minute book, Bailey wasn't considered maybe an emollient enough character to, to lead. Plus, people like Ray Smith had, had captained the sort of schoolboy Bailey when he was at Dulwich College in these wartime matches. And had a, a good measure of his, his character. Um, so then Doug Insull, who again, like Bailey, come out of Cambridge University, was a, a, a lighted on as the chosen successor. So imagine you're Peter Smith, you're in your late 30s, you're Ray Smith in your mid to late 30s. Ray Smith has captained Men on the cricket field during the war has been lauded for his sportsmanship, the way he's, he's led his men, the selflessness with which he, he led his team. But we come to 1950, 1951, and suddenly, right, you're back in the ranks. We're getting this fresh-faced 21, 22-year-old out of Cambridge University to lead you. As well, there's the underlying tensions about pay, about pay when you're injured, about the availability of a massa. So I think it matters really came to a head in the early 1950s. And I think Ray wasn't a major protagonist in all this, but I think his cousin Peter was a major protagonist. It's something that if you read the biographies and autobiographies of people like Doug Insull, Trevor Bailey, you sort of get attention about. But another factor was the cricketers in those days, they didn't uh, air they, their dirty linen in public. Um, some people I've spoken to and you dug in Sol very well could detect a certain coolness when the name of Ray Smith came up, but neither anything that Ray ever said to any of his family or Doug Insol ever said in public would you wouldn't have been able to detect any tension between them. But I think Insol found it very difficult coming into a team with the Smith cousins who had been you know playing for Essex for nearly two decades, who you know basically were put onto the ball at both ends by, by Tom Pierce and left to get on with it. 
so you had the tension on the field you had the professional amateur distinction of it and then the ongoing uh rifts over how much do we get paid and and the other sorts of fringe benefits of being a player i don't usually care much for those frank tell-all autobiographies yeah. but a few a few stray remarks and and bitchy asides would have would have come in handy here i yeah. think uh, we shouldn't form the impression that uh, Ray was a mere county journey, uh, a journeyman. Mm. He came remarkably close to England selection on more than one occasion, didn't he? He was mentioned as a possible for the 1947-48 um, tour of the West Indies, uh, just after doing the double for the first time in his career. Yeah, well, that was the era where England still thought it um, appropriate, if it wasn't an Ashes tour, to send, you know, a if not a B-string team, a sort of A-minor stroke team out. Um, he was one of several rounders mentioned for that berth alongside people like Morris Tremlett. Um, he didn't quite make that cut. Um, his name uh, came up again in the early 50s as a possible. And since I've written the book, and I'm now researching Peter Smith for, for another book, um, Peter mentioned Ray as a possible as well in the 1946 and 1947 seasons as well very close you know the men are very close together so um some kind words about his cousin but yeah ray you would think well if ray were around today with the various formats and opportunities to play for england there are in t20s and and the 50 over game and the test matches you would think you'd be almost certainly have, have represented england he did represent england in a few unofficial tests though didn't he he went to india uh, for a commonwealth tour it was it, yeah it was less so england it was a, a genuinely international 11. Um, right. i think the mcc had decided not to tour india in 1949-50 i think a combination of logistics uh, the political situation wasn't wasn't great at that time, and so the Indian Board of Control um, or the Indian Cricket Board um, approached George Duckworth, the old Lancashire and England wicketkeeper, who had connections with players in the Lancashire League, to see if he could put together an international eleven of Test standard to take to India to play an unofficial Test, and and so he did. There was a lot of um, Australians who, you know, some of them didn't see eye to eye with Don Bradman, who were playing in the, the leagues at that time, Bill Alley, Cess Pepper, Jock Livingstone, amongst them, George Tribe. There was a smattering of West Indians, most famously Frankie Worrell, who had his own issues, I think, with the, the cricketing authorities in the West Indies, a man called John Holt. Um, there was a smattering of English county professionals from Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. And then somehow Ray Smith as well, so it, it, it's slightly anomalous. We've got all these Lancashire League professionals, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire professionals, and then Ray from Essex. Uh, originally, Cliff Gladwin was going to go, but he had to pull out. So I think Ray was offered that berth. Uh, I think the connection might have been that occasionally through the Ray Smith and the Peter Smith story, whenever there's any discontent rumbling at Essex about pay and remuneration, um, suddenly the offer of a a Lancashire League contract hose interview, which is dangled in front of the Essex committee, and they somehow then find the means to keep hold of Ray Smith. Um, so I think that might have been the connection there. So yeah, he uh, went to uh, India, Pakistan and Ceylon, as it then was, um, 1949-50, played in foreign official tests, and not staggeringly successful figures, but he certainly didn't disgrace himself, you know, against players like um, Zare, Merchant, Umrigar. He um, had a pretty successful tour. And I think given the quality of character you needed on, on a tour like that, certainly, you know, was a very successful and popular member of the party and made lifelong friends. Now let's have a word about his most storied match. It's probably one he would have preferred <laughs> to have forgotten. 1948, Australia v Essex. What happened there? Well, Essex became the only side to bowl the 1948 Australians out in a day. And did it with 10 minutes to spare, as, as Tom Pierce liked to tell people in later life. You know, he was the only captain that managed to wheedle out the Australians in a day. Unfortunately, 721 runs had been um, scored by the time that happened. I think he had, um, Ray was bowling early in, inning, in the innings. I think he had Bill Brown dismissed off a, off a no ball. So things might have been different. Um, but he, he told one of his sons later, it's one of the easiest days he ever, ever had in the field because the ball just kept sailing past him. Uh, all he had to do was collect the throw-in back from the crowd. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, the Australians rattled up 721 in a day, Bradman 187. It was the match where Keith Miller famously was dismissed for a duck, and 
everybody has their own different versions of why Miller was dismissed for a duck. Boredom um, didn't like to see county bowlers being slaughtered by Bradman and his sort of all-conquering juggernaut. We shall never know. But yeah, Ray was certainly on the field that day. Um, took his fair amount of stick, but um, you know, kept at it, and that was the measure of the Essex team. It was a you know amazing day for the spectators, and you know, played his full part in it. He accumulated some rather happier memories um, in the course of Essex's rather storied rival rivalry with Yorkshire. Yeah, I could never get to the bottom of the um, issue we had with Yorkshire. It could just be a, a, a matter of approach to the game of the sort of you know you play hard to win, lose or draw, but you play hard and that's it. As opposed to Yorkshire's famed sort of um, win 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 mentality so his first encounter with yorkshire came at um huddersfield not far where i'm sitting now actually in 1935 um the all conquering yorkshire team um were hosting essex and they were bowled out cheaply twice um stan nichols took um i think 11 wickets in the match um he then scored 146 with the bat ray supported him in a in a sort of okay partnership towards the towards the end of that innings and yeah yorkshire were bowled out twice and lost within two days um to a mercurial essex side who could be brilliant on occasions and could be um on the knees on other occasions i think that's the, the one thing i pick up about county cricket in that period is yorkshire aside teams could yo-yo you know their performances um but the underlying factors, who knows? It could be tiredness from travelling. Remember, players had to sort of get on trains and often arrive in the next town they're playing in at four o'clock in the morning. A couple of hours sleep out on the field. and A brilliant team one day could become a, a lousy team the next. But yeah, he was involved in the, the famous demolition of Yorkshire in two days by Essex in 1935. Um, it was a match in 1939 I've already alluded to at Bramall Lane, Sheffield. Um, Essex won that match. The Yorkshire press was... Um, typically begrudging of that victory, bemoaning, I think, the absence of Hutton and, and others on test duty and um, um, a, a, a turgidness in the Essex batting, criticising Jack O'Connor, which is, um, you know, if you take any note of Neville Cardis and the way he claims Yorkshire and Lancashire approached the game in those days, it was an interesting take. But yeah, Ray scored 91 in that match, which is the highest first-class score. Um, there's a very... Um, poignant um point on the scorecard involving farns and verity two players for whom you know it's probably i think they only had two more three more first class matches to play after that um so yeah post-war essex didn't beat yorkshire again until 1956 ray had already announced his retirement and um he was playing yorkshire at south end the same ground where the Australians had racked up the 721. And um, he was in at the end where I think Essex needed something like eight to win in the last over. And he was facing fiery Fred Truman. Um, and he managed to score those eight runs um, for victory. Um, he fa famously told everybody that if he could ever manage to beat Yorkshire again, He'd, he'd, be, he'd give away a month's salary to be able to do that. Now, it's not known whether he he, he did so, but, um, yeah, he, he managed to strike, I think, two falls off the bowling of, of Truman, and that ball with which he did it was collected by his teammates. Um, a silver um, badge was put on it, commemorating the achievement, and now it's actually in the museum at the Chelmsford Cricket Ground for everybody to go and sort of see... And remember, Ray Smith's contribution to Essex and the game of cricket. A few words, perhaps, in conclusion about Ray Smith off the field. He was, by profession, a farmer, uh, with mm. all a farmer's robust physicality, virtually never in injured. Uh, you have a very good anecdote about yeah. his attitude to the masseuse. In the mid-50s, after the professionals are sort of agitated for, you know, some sort of alleviation of aches and strains so they could, you know, keep playing and keep earning their money, Essex employed a man called Harold Dalton, a surname Wuzzer, who actually toured, I think he went on the 54 Ashes tour as well as a masseur. Um, and the Essex Minute Books re records all the treatments that Dalton gave out in a particular season. I think they wanted to see whether getting value for money. Right near the top of the list was Peter Smith, Trevor Bailey, as you'd imagine, with his fast medium bowling. 
And right at the bottom of the list was Ray Smith. He, he, when there was a bruise, he, he, he'd have it seen to, but he never went for any sort of maintenance work. Ray's maintenance work, I think, was working on his farm. Um, and he once told one of his son's doctors, no, never need one. The only time you need to see a doctor is to go and have a drink with him. Um, it was, uh, from, the, from the impression I got from people who knew him well, he was a quiet man on the field. And he was a quiet and modest man off the field. But if people wanted to engage him in talking about cricket, he would be very willing to talk about that. Um, after um, a few years of retirement, he went to coach at Felstead School. And it was lovely to hear from one of his ex-pupils who Ray coached in the first 11 about not only Ray as an inspirational coach, but Ray as a man, as, as a fair-minded person who would put down the arrogance in the team and was interested in the character of how he played as well as the, the mere statistics and how he would take certain uh, groups of players under his wing and, and nurture them as, as individuals. And, you know, he, he, his wife would get to know them as well. And he was a real inspiration to some of those boys at Felstead School. So it's, it's nice, right right through his cricketing career, yes, on the field, yes, with Essex, the Commonwealth eleven, and those contributions, the wartime cricket, but he never stopped giving back to the game as a coach. And latterly, um, in the later years of his life, he moved up to Warwickshire, where his sons ran a, a restaurant, and he would still be conversant with the Warwickshire committee and the players. Um, I was told Bob Willis, when he was England captain, would, would host pre-tour lunches at, at the uh, pre-tour dinners at the restaurant. So Ray's involvement with the game stayed right through his life. Uh, as you say, a very quiet, private man. And as mm. such, we don't know much about his private life, but we do learn something about it uh, during that Commonwealth tour. Uh, he and Sec Pepper both got into a bit of trouble on the domestic front, didn't they? I, I, I think Ray's first marriage had, had um, not been a happy one for a, a length of time. I think the amount of time required away obviously during the the domestic cricket season you're away half the time playing matches in worcestershire yorkshire or wherever uh, also during the winter although he never went as we've said on a official england tour he spent one winter coaching in in south africa concurrent with the 747 8 mcc tour there i know he received an invitation to coach in the argentine I couldn't find anything else about that, frustratingly. But I do get the impression that he would spend winters away coaching, stroke playing, half the summer away. So I think that might have put his first marriage under under some aspects of strain. Um, but quickly after that marriage um, broke up, he met um, Beth Hawkes, a uh, repertory act actress um, at the Northampton Rep, uh, introduced by mutual friends who we'd known in wartime cricket. And then they had a long and, and happy marriage after that um, and produced two sons who are extremely helpful in the research and production of this book. I'm just about out of questions, but perhaps uh, I could ask you before we, we wrap this up, if, if there was anything you, you particularly wanted to add or to have you Yeah, I think one, one thing that really struck me during the research is um, when he died in 1996, um, Ray chose to be buried in, I think one of the first woodland burial sites in the UK. So there was no gravestone that marks Ray's resting place. Um, I visited it and you have to ask the owner of the, of the field. He has a record of where different people are buried. And I would never, it was just a clump of trees. And he took me to the exact tree where Ray and later his, his wife Beth were um, uh, buried. He, he loved nature that much. He was a keen gardener. Um, that I think he wanted to be buried amongst nature. So there was no designated or there's no marked resting place for Ray Smith. But if you're really keen to find out about him and contact the Green Haven Woodland Burial Site, the owner there will take you there and you can stand on the very spot, which I did. And it, you know, it was a very special moment for me. I wanted to conclude this by reading a passage from John Arlott. Um, mm. Either I could or, or you could. Who's, who's got the best Hampshire accent here, Rodney? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I can't do that 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 uh, almost piratical burr that no, Arlen think, had. Uh, or one of us would have to down two bottles of wine before trying to do <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I think so. 
Uh, why, why don't you have a go? Okay, I'll have a go at it. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, this is an extract that John Arlott uh, was invited to write for a benefit brochure for Ray Smith for the 1951 season. And they are fine words written by a fine cricket writer about a fine cricketer. Although he himself will probably never forgive me to saying so in print, Ray Smith is near indeed to being the ideal cricketer. I do not mean that he is a great player. He is a good one and probably knows it. But he is not great, and he knows that too. But he is a mighty good man to have on your side. Not only can he bat, defensively at need, or with heady stroke play when the game demands fast scoring, and bowl either swingers, or, when the wicket helps, round the wicket off breaks, and throw in some fairly sound and versatile fielding. But he does it all with the bonus of enthusiasm, which makes the man who values cricket warm to him at once. When someone has to bowl long hours, a good batsman, well set on a perfect wicket. When someone has to bowl long spells and between overs, take some hard working place in the deep field instead of being rested close to the wicket. When someone has to bat hard against the tide of the game, on all or any of these occasions, his captain may turn to Ray Smith, who will do the job with the same keenness as he would if the scales were weighted on his side instead of against him. Of all the professional cricketers in this country, no one better deserves a big benefit than Ray. Ask the men who play with or against him. And when you have gathered that he is at his best, a steady and hard working medium pacer, a useful off break bowler and a batsman who can force the pace with anyone. You will also be told that he is about as good a chap as you will find in the game today. Whenever I see those alarmingly square shoulders, that exuberant trampling run up, that untidy rebellion of dark hair and that broad grin, which mark Ray Smith. I know cricket is going to be played hard and enjoyed and that when play is over, there'll be good talk of the game and the humour of one who enjoys life and his fellow men as much as he enjoyed the game, which happens by what he must regard as luck to be his living. That was brilliant. Couldn't so, have said it better myself. Well, thanks for this. I, I think it went swimmingly. Yes. Nice to, um, yeah, nice to meet you. And um, nice to meet you. you know, having read a lot of your email trails recently as well. Oh dear, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> I'm afraid that didn't go very well, did it? <laughs> yeah. I think you shook a few trees there. <laughs> I, I think I did. I think I know what the third rail is now. I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll keep my revolutionary opinions to myself for a time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, Thanks a ton, John. Right. Cheers, nice mate. to see bye you. Bye. Cheers, and bye bye.